Welcome, my happy little ramblers, to Reese Rambles, the official podcast of Control Alt Reese, my weekly look at all the comings and goings and movings and shakings in the world of retro tech, retro gaming, and vintage computing. And yeah, a bit of a weird hybrid mashup of my old and new intros there, but there you go. This is all unscripted. There's no structure to any of this. How you all doing? Welcome to the weekend. Of course, we've all just had a nice short four-day work week, which is lovely. Uh, I think uh, I think that also applies to the US as well, doesn't it? We had a bank holiday here, and I think it was also a holiday over there as well. And I just have I just got some interesting stuff on the desk in front of me here. Of course, this is related to a current video, so I guess I'll just very quickly go over it all. I've got my STE here. This is my childhood Atari STE. It's got its uh, little Ultra Satan hard drive emulator plugged into it. But more importantly, we've got these interesting looking scaling devices here. So we've got the original OSSC. Now, this is my uh, my OSSC that has served me very well over the years. I've got the RetroTINK 5X and I've got the OSSC Pro. And these are all things that take a signal from an older computer or a console and they upscale it and allow you to use it with a modern display, of course. Hopefully I don't need to explain that to you, but I just have, if you didn't know. So there we go. Um, of course, the OSSC Pro, I'm helping to test this. I got this from Marcus, the creator, and uh, yeah, um, a video has gone out on the main channel this week where I just did a very, very light, uh, just a quick look at a few different PCs and things. Didn't go in depth with the lag testing and stuff like that. Hopefully I don't need to explain myself on that and the reasons are pretty obvious, but um, yeah, I don't want to go over, over all of that stuff again. So that's what I've got in the desk on the desk in front of me. And I have just recorded a video with all of this, which was a request from my patron, uh, Costado, uh, my, my, my good friend from the Netherlands. And I must admit, I was intrigued as to how well the ST was going to work with the new OSSC Pro and how that compared to the other scalar options that are out there at the moment, because it's uh, it's quite a difficult system. I think it's fair to say. But uh, yeah, hopefully that video will be out on my second channel at some point. Maybe it's out already or maybe it will be out tomorrow. Maybe it'll be later on next week. Who knows? Let's let's maintain that air of mystery. Let's pretend that I'm maintaining an air of mystery and not that I'm just completely disorganized. So yes, <laughs> and um, I, 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 there has been quite an interesting development this week. I keep talking about this Stop Killing Games campaign from uh, from Ross Scott from Accursed Farms. Fantastic glo global initiative to get developers to, uh, to, 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 to stop abandoning their games, um, basically, is, is the long and the short of it. And of course, there was a, there was a bit of a revelation in the UK last week. We had a petition, and it had like twenty six thousand signatures. And then, of course, a general election was called by Mr. Sunak. And that's that. The petitions the petition site is now closed. Didn't get to the hundred thousand signatures. We did get a response. Then the petitions uh, regulator people said, "No, that's not a good enough response." And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the the reason. You know, the, the game industry is so powerful that I'm guessing that they're the ones that force the Conservative Party's hand and force them into this general election so they don't need to answer our petition, which is very unfair. But there you go. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So, but yeah, a personal experience of mine from this week. So I've actually, over the past few weeks, I've been playing GTA 4 again, uh, oddly enough, randomly enough, just kind of randomly fired it up on my, on my living room PC and, and started driving around and then found myself getting really into the story again. So I started it again from scratch. And I've been playing through that, just, uh, you know, in those kind of odd uh, half an hours that you get in the evenings and stuff. Back in the world of, uh, of Nico Bellic from uh, GTA 4, of course, Liberty City. Uh, one of the best GTA games, in my personal opinion. Not quite as big in scope as GTA 5, of course, as you would expect, but... Um, Still a great game, and I, I remember it very fondly from my Xbox 360, and at some point I must have picked it, picked it up on the PC, probably as part of some kind of Rockstar bundle thing. So how is this relevant to the Stop Killing Games thing? Because, you know, I fired it up, it still works, it's got that online, it's got like the Rockstar Social Club online component thing that it's all connected to, but that's all still up and running and GTA 4 still supported. So what's the problem? Well, very interesting personal experience this week. I discovered that... Um, some of the songs have disappeared. Some of my favourite songs. So I like Liberty Rock Radio. I listen to the rock radio station when I'm driving around in that game. And I distinctly remember some some absolute bangers like, you know, Stevie Nicks, Edge of 17 and stuff like that from back when I played it on the 360. And they hadn't come up. I hadn't heard them playing. And it was it was kind of playing on my mind a little bit because I've, I've played like hours and hours of this now. And I've not heard some of these songs that I very distinctly remember. And I was thinking, well... Was the PC version different? Was it, you know, different license, different song licenses, something like that? So I got so intrigued that I Googled it. 
And uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, there was a, there was an update back in 2018. So this is from April 2018. And essentially, this is very much a similar situation to what happened with that game, The Crew, which I've been talking about, which is all connected to this campaign, in that the licenses for the songs expired. They only had like a 10 year license for those songs. And once that time was up, they had to remove them from the game, even from people who'd already bought the game. So there you go, it's a diminished experience. And it's quite a big list. Um, of course, the, the, the main character in GTA 4 is, is Nico Bellic. He's, uh, he's a Russian immigrant. Uh, so there's, there's quite a big sort of Russian component to it. There's a Russian radio station and, and all of that stuff. It's all tied into the story. And a big chunk of the songs that went were those. <laughs> um, not that I was, would have listened to those anyway, but I think uh, some of them are kind of tied into the story and stuff. Um, so they're all just gone because the, you know they only licensed them for a certain length of time. And yeah, if we go to my favourite station, Liberty Rock Radio, uh, Smashing Pumpkins 1979, what an absolute tune. Can't listen to it in GTA 4 anymore. Uh, Stevie Nicks, like I mentioned, Electric Light Orchestra, Evil Woman. I've seen ELO twice live, massive fan. Great song, doesn't come up in the game anymore. We've got Bowie, we've got Sabbath, we've got ACDC, we've got The Doors, we've got uh, you know, Jefferson Starship, Iron Maiden. Some absolute tunes there, some of those in the expansion, The Lost and The Damned, which I haven't got around to playing again yet, but... Um, all gone. Um, yeah, isn't that sad? Um, and of course, all, all the other stations are affected as well. It's not just the not just the rock station. There's a big list of stuff here, uh, particularly like uh, like the Vice City one. That was the other one I noticed. Sometimes sometimes I tune into that as well. Got those '80s bangers on there. Womack and Womack, teardrops gone. Um, John Farnham, you're the voice. What an absolute anthem from the '80s. Also gone. All those lovely, uh, all those iconic songs missing from that game's soundtrack because the license expir uh, expired, so they just had to remove them. And uh, yeah, that was back in 2018. So I appreciate this isn't news, but uh, it, once I looked this up, once, once it kind of twigged that something wasn't quite right with the, uh, with the soundtrack to that game, and I actually Googled it, and this came up, I thought, yeah, that, that's bang on topic for everything that's uh, been going on in the news with this whole campaign and stuff, so... Thought I would share that story with you, but uh, yeah, let's get into some let's get into some other stuff. The Acorn Electron is a machine that doesn't really get any coverage on my channel or on the rambles here because, well, why? Why doesn't it get much coverage? I mean, it was my very first computer. It's one I have very fond memories of, and one that kind of set me up on this path that I'm on today. I remember my dad bringing it home, and I was like four or five years old, and. Just remember lying on the living room floor in front of the family TV, the only TV in the house, playing on that Electron, playing all those Acorn Soft arcade knockoffs. Uh, they had their own uh, unlicensed versions of stuff like Pac-Man and Frogger and, and that kind of thing. And I think because Acorn was so small, I think they just kind of flew under the radar, even though it was officially sanctioned. Um, yeah, unlicensed knockoffs. A bit weird. I also remember playing Sphinx Adventure, which was a text adventure game. And I, I remember having like a big... A uh, list of notes and things that I've been making with my dad playing that in the evenings. Fond, fond memories of that computer until it blew up. And indeed, I have one around the studio somewhere that isn't working and hasn't been repairable up to this point because the ULA chip has failed. The ULA, of course, being kind of the heart of the whole system. Custom chip designed and made by Acorn. No stranger to making their own custom chips, of course, around the same time they were working on stuff like the ARM CPU. And the uh, yeah, the ULA was a bit of a miracle of technology, taking all of the stuff, all of, all of those individual chips that were in the Electron's bigger brother, of course, the BBC Micro, and cutting in, cutting them down, cutting out some stuff that they uh, kind of thought that uh, was perhaps less important, like some of the video modes and, and some of the audio channels and stuff, and packaging it, packaging it all up nicely in one custom chip to make the Electron. Sadly, quite a fragile thing nowadays and a very common failure point for those machines. A bit of an Achilles heel on that, uh, on that machine. So, fantastic news to hear this week from uh, Mogway, who is a friend of the channel. And um, there is another friend of the channel involved in this who will get a shout out in a second. Uh, yeah, the ULA has finally been recreated. And this is something that's happened on a lot of its kind of contemporary systems like the Spectrum and the Commodore 64. I think mo it, all of the custom chips in the Spectrum uh, certainly have been recreated and you can actually build a whole brand new one from scratch here and now we're one step closer to that with the humble little electron as well thanks to uh, this fantastic work on this project the name of the project is the jamsoft electron ula and yeah pretty much exactly what it says on the tin as they say it's an open source recreation of the original acorn electron ula chip it uses an ice 40 based fpga board 
And yeah, designed by Chris Jamieson, aka Mogway. Wonderful. Uh, or is that Mugway? I don't know. Anyway, so it says that it's a no frills ULA. That does come with a, a bit of a, a bit of a caveat. Well, not a caveat because that would be a negative thing. But uh, yeah, a bit of a a bit of an asterisk attached attached to it. But first, we've got the list of features. We've got the keyboard controls, all the keyboard inputs that you would expect. Um, tape interface is working. Loading, saving, remote motor control all works great. Uh, it's got RGB output, and that has been tested with an RGB to HDMI as well. If you want to build a thoroughly modern electron with an FPGA-based ULA and HDMI output. Um, Composite out, mono and colour with jumper because uh, that, was a, that was a mod that could be done to that machine very easily back in the day. Uh, RF out seems fine too. This, this bullet point did make me laugh. Um, guess didn't do a huge amount of testing with that, which you probably wouldn't in this day and age. DRAM controller, which works with the 4164 DRAM chips and all the usual electrony things it says here. And there's a list of examples of games that are known to work. Some absolute classics here, Chucky Egg, uh, Exile, Citadel, um, Elite, um, Snapper and Zalago, which of course are some of those uh, knockoff Acorn Soft arcade games that I mentioned before. And it's also been tested with some uh, some popular peripherals for the Electron, so the LKSD uh, SD card interface and the uh, First Byte joystick interface clone. I really need to get my Electron out. This is really making me want to play with it again. Um, it says that it's not compatible with some peripherals that use the NMI signal. Don't know what that is. Um, but uh, yeah, saying that that could be added later on, but evidently wasn't a priority because I guess nothing uses it. And that's um, that little asterisk that I mentioned. So this is basically a one-to-one -one clone of the original ULA, but yeah, he has added an improvement to this, which is a turbo mode. And you can enable it with a key combo, so you can press control, uh, control caps lock and two. And what it does is it swaps out the, the lowest 8K of RAM in the Acon Electron with the 8K that's built into the FPGA, which is much faster. And this actually emulates uh, quite a popular, uh, quite popular add-on for the Electron that actually existed back in the day. Basically replicates that. So, and there's a really, really good video about this. And this is the point that I'm getting to. Uh, this is from Lee and uh, of course the channel More Fun Making It. I had a chat with Lee on uh, on a very early ramble of mine before I started doing video and stuff. So um, I'll link to that actually if you're interested in hearing a bit about his story and a bit about his channel. It was uh, it was a year or so ago now. But uh, yeah, uh, Lee, his he, this is a world exclusive for his channel. Really, really proud of him because he's he's a lovely guy and he deserves this. Um, you know, for, for over five thousand views in uh, in less than twenty four hours, which is fantastic for his channel. In fact, he's beating me on views on, on a lot of videos just lately because he, he is very good. Um, but that's by the by. And it's the story of him getting this this electron that's, of course, well, sorting through his, his pile of dead electrons and trying to find one that's uh, that's repairable and that's a, a suitable uh, candidate for this for this upgrade. And he goes through and shows the whole build process, shows some of his mistakes and, and stuff as well, you know, struggling with SMD soldering and stuff that I, I find very, very relatable. And yeah, don't want to spoil the ending, but um, I, yeah, he gets it working in the end and shows how it all works. So I've just spoiled the ending. But yeah, brilliant video, this brilliant video. I nearly made it my video of the week, but um, you know, it's a, it's a bit sycophantic choosing your friend's videos for video of the week. So um, yeah. Um, it's a great project, and of course, if you want to see, want to learn a bit more about the Electron and how it works, I can highly recommend that. And of course, I will link to the video and the GitHub page down in the uh, description, as always. But uh, just great to see the Electron getting some love. And there's so many dead Electrons out there, just like mine, that are going to be saved as a result of this project. So fantastic work from the hardware community, from Mogway. And yeah, more of this kind of stuff, please. So from one FPGA story to another and a topic that I'm covering increasingly on these rambles because, yeah, making, making really big waves in the, in the world of retro computing and retro gaming, just all the fantastic things that it can do. Everything from that humble Electron ULA chip all the way up to the Mr. Project and running stuff like a, an entire PlayStation or Sega Saturn or N64 on, on that one FPGA chip, which is pretty incredible. And uh, yeah, a world that's only getting more impressive and uh, complex by the day. As covered last week, actually, I should I should mention, I had a really nice comment from Pixel Cherry Ninja, who I'd given a shout out to, who covers all of this stuff in great detail. So a really great channel. And uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by. I didn't realise you were a, a regular rambler. 
But yes, there was a uh, there was a Mister related story that I covered a few weeks back, and there has been a little update, a little extra sort of morsel of information that I thought I'd cover because I'm quite excited about this one. And this comes from Taki Udon, another YouTube channel, and a very well uh, respected member of the community, the hardware development and modding community as well, of course. And if you think back a few weeks, basically uh, he'd announced that he was cloning the DE10 Nano board, which is the board that's at the heart of the Mr. Project, that uh, kind of educational uh, board with the FPGA chip on it. Very, very expensive, that's the problem. I mean, it's $200 uh, just for the board alone. And basically, he'd announced that he'd cloned the entire thing for less than half the price, $99, um, which is pretty incredible. And, you know, lots of people had kind of always said that it wasn't possible. But, um, yeah, apparently it is possible. Apparently it is happening. And it's coming from someone who's uh, very well respected and very liked. So it's it's going to happen. Also, of course, mentioned that uh, he'd managed to clone the RAM uh, module for that as well for uh, $15 versus the $60 that it usually costs. So very exciting stuff. But he also mentioned at the time, and this is the point of this story, that um, he, he was working on a few other sort of related projects and was going to release a bit more information on those in the uh, in the coming sort of weeks and months. One of those being a handheld. And of course, we have the analog pocket, which is, uh, I mean, it's, you know, $200 odd dollars. Issues with supply with those, they make them in batches, they release them, they always sell out instantly and are very much in demand and they just can't seem to make enough of the things. Um, but yeah, he has announced that his version, which is going to be presumably based on the, this same uh, cloned um, D10 technology, I think, not quite sure if he's clarified on uh, what which specific FPJ will be at the heart of this but has released a few more details on this. So yeah, $150, a competitor to the analog pocket, which like I say is, is usually just over $200. And it's gonna have a better screen as well. He's experimenting with an AMOLED screen uh, compared to the uh, analog pockets LTPS LCD panel. And I don't know what that means, but apparently AMOLED's better. And this is a story over on timeextension.com, of course. And uh, he's basically said that the AMOLED screen technology is much more flexible and much better suited for all the different aspect ratios and things that all of those old computers and consoles used back in the day. And who am I to argue? And yeah, the MSRP of the handheld should still be $150 or less if there is enough interest. There's also some more information uh, buried in kind of a series of tweets. Um, just, uh, just referring to the other hardware specs of this handheld that it has in development. So uh, it's also stated that the system's D-pad will be a non-issue, indicating that it will be a best-in-class digital pad. Uh, there will be twin analog sticks and front-firing speakers. So yes, very interested, uh, very interesting. It showed some of the screen testing in a video, which I won't show you here because it's not on the actual handheld itself. But um, oh, that is over on Twitter if you want to go and have a look at that. But um, yeah, he's also working on a flagship FPGA device, a mainstream variant and a budget option. So loads and loads of stuff in the works there, but uh, a competitor to the analog pocket. Of course, I built that uh, FPGA based Game Boy, which I talked about last week and I also covered in a video on this channel. And yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, having another option can only be a good thing. Oh dear, having a very tired, very scatterbrained week this week. Lots of retakes for all of these stories so far, but uh, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, and I'm still having a nice time, which is the most important thing. So let's talk about my favourite subject for a moment, and hopefully that'll uh, give me the motivation that I need to, to power through to the end of this week's ramble. And of course, my favourite subject, as we all well know, is me, it's myself, because I'm an egomaniac. No. <laughs> No, but um, yeah, I, I did release a video this week, and of course I do talk about these in the ramble, so we'll just take a look at that and see how it's doing. Now, I say this week, of course, this only went out earlier today, about five hours ago. It's just hit a thousand views, which is quite nice. YouTube informs me that uh, that is about the same as usual. Thank you, YouTube. Um, 120.9 watch hours, about the same as usual. And this video has got 1,042 views, which is similar to the 770 to 1,500 that your videos usually get. Thanks, YouTube. Useful stuff. So this is all about the OSSC Pro, and I thought I'd talk a little, a little bit more about the background behind why I've got this and what it is. So there was a bit of a joke at the beginning of this video that uh, Bob from Retro RGB, 
messages me all the time with all sorts of random stuff. And he has seen the video and he did find it. He did find it quite funny, thankfully. Uh, did see the funny side of that. And indeed he does. <laughs> It'll be the middle of the night and I'll get a, a random message from Bob uh, asking me a random question or whatever. I love the guy. Such a lovely guy. Such a, a great member of the community. And of course, I've appeared on his channel, had that really great chat with him a while back. I've done some writing for his website for Retro RGB. And uh, yeah, he's a good egg. So um, yeah, he, uh, he, he one of these random messages was basically concerning the, uh, the, the guy that invented the open source scan converter. And of course, that's very much Bob's world. He does talk about video scalers and all of that stuff on his YouTube channel and on his website. And of course, he's good friends with Marcus, who invented one of the, one of the best video scalers on the market at the moment. And Marcus was looking for someone to help test the new version with various different weird and wonderful PCs. Because, of course, you've got to test it with real hardware, and he, he doesn't own every piece of hardware ever, ever made. Um, so, yeah, he needs help with, from various members of the community to help to test that. So I got chatting to Marcus directly. Lovely guy. Again, you know, we got on really well talking about old computers and stuff. And he sent me an OSSC Pro prototype. The final hardware is done. There has been one batch that has gone on sale and there are some people who've actually bought them and they are starting to pop up around the place in YouTube videos and stuff. Um, but yeah, he had this he had this very near final production prototype and was looking to uh, test it with some stuff. And I said, well, you know, I've, I've got a computer with a Voodoo card in it. I've got um, you know the S3 Verge card. I've, I've got old DOS PCs. I've got modern uh, Windows PCs. I've got, I've, I mean, I've got everything. I've got the Atari ST, you know, which was notoriously quite awkward with with scalers in the past, with stuff like the Retro Tink and uh, indeed the, uh, the the previous OSSC. He was like, yeah, okay, I'll send it over. Um, just try and plugging it into as much stuff as you can and see how well it works, and give me some feedback if uh, you come across anything that doesn't work. And indeed, in that video, I do show something that doesn't work, which is one of the video modes on the uh, on the Voodoo card on uh, GL Quake. So I fed that back to Marcus, and he's. Uh, it turns out that he he was already kind of aware of that and has purchased the hardware to be able to test that himself, which is cool. But yes, testing is of course ongoing and quite exciting to be uh, you know an, an, an important part of this project. So that was quite cool. There's also another project, and I was kind of involved with this, and I just wanted to give them another little shout out, to be honest. I was kind of involved with this in that I was used for scale, for measuring this thing. And this is, of course, the uh, 3D printed computer space, which was the uh, very first uh, video arcade game created by uh, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney, of course, the founders of Atari, uh, before they were Atari. So really important piece of history. And this was my video of the week a few weeks ago, so I won't go over it all again, but uh, I was really pleased this week to see this getting some coverage on the news, not only on the actual BBC News website, but also um, they had a visit from the local BBC News, BBC Points West, who covered it. And a really nice little piece this, just covering the arcade archive and the work that they put in to build this replica machine. And then there was a much longer interview with them, uh, which is on uh, Nicky Price's show on... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, on uh, on the uh, local uh, BBC radio station. So cool to see that project getting some more coverage and getting some proper press coverage as well. And uh, yeah, uh, the stuff they're doing down there is only going from strength to strength. And because I was used as, uh, as you know, as, as the uh, as the measuring stick, so to speak, for this machine, because there are pictures of me with a real machine and they needed to get a sense of scale because they don't have access to a, an, an original computer space arcade cabinet. Um, you know, I'm going to take all the credit for the entire thing. So speaking of video of the week, I think it's about time we had, well, video of the week. Yeah, no, I'm not bluffing you. It's time. And this is a great video that uh, I watched earlier this week from a really, really good channel, a channel that I've been watching for a very long time now. He's a great guy. He puts a huge, huge amount of work into his videos. He, he doesn't, you know, he's not churning them out every week like a lot of channels. He only does a few a year. And it's, you know, the work that goes into them really shows. There's all the uh, 3D rendering stuff and, uh, and everything else. And, and the research that goes into them is absolutely top notch. So, don't ha I don't hesitate for a second to recommend any of this guy's videos, but his latest one I thought was particularly interesting. And this channel is uh, Wrestling With Gaming, of course, which you've probably come across. And this video is all about the time Nintendo sold flashcards and ran a ROM site. And 
it's a fascinating story. So I knew about the Famicom, obviously the Famicom, the original version of the uh, NES that was sold in Japan. I knew there was the Famicom disc system. And I also knew that uh, some shops had kiosks that you could go up to and you could uh, you could actually uh, rewrite the discs and, and you could download games onto them, which was incredibly forward thinking of Nintendo. You know, rather than just buying the cartridges for the system, you could actually reuse the discs. Um, and then, of course, they they had the, uh, it was the Satellaview, I think it was called, which was their satellite system for the Super Famicom. And they actually broadcast games over the air, over this satellite system that you could download onto a flash cart, and then you could play them on your console. But I didn't realise that there was another, a, a, another sort of part of this puzzle, of, of this Nintendo um, downloadable game sort of history, which is this cartridge here. And it's called the Power Flash Cart. And... Yeah, essentially similar setup to the Famicom Disk System kiosks in that you could, uh, you, you know, you bought this cartridge for a certain price and then you could take it into a shop and you could uh, plug it into a machine and essentially download games onto it. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but I will allow him to explain a bit more detail and a bit more story behind it. And it is a really fascinating story and, like I say, really well-made video. So, uh, yeah, I will put a link to this down in the usual places. It's, uh, what is it, 14 minutes 57 long. It's got 15,000 views in the past five days. And great channel, great channel, great video. I've said that a thousand times, haven't I? That's video of the week. And so our time together this week begins to draw to a close. That's right, that's all the stories that I have for you from the wider world of retro computing and retro gaming, but I do have one slightly more personal story that I thought I would share with you because I thought you might find it quite amusing. So in my day job, I am a... Uh, a software development contractor is the is the kind of the job title that I usually give. And that means that I go around and I work with, I only have like three big regular customers and work on site with them alongside their people on kind of their internal software projects. And there's one place I've been working, it's, it's, it's a bacon factory, which sounds exciting. And it is, I mean, they make bacon. Um, and uh, I've been working for them for, getting on for 10 years now and, you know, going there at least a couple of days a week and I was in the kitchen I was in the kitchen one afternoon this week making myself a cup of tea as you do and someone walked in or walked up behind me and said Reese and I turned around and I thought I don't know this guy <laughs> uh, you know I mean I've been there long enough for, but they have like two sites they have two different buildings on the same site and I don't know a lot of the people from the other building I don't know most of the people from the building that I'm based in to be fair I'd never seen this guy before. Um, maybe a little bit older than me, you know, a beard and you know, shirt and a smart business dress. It's like Reese, you, you know, you, I love your YouTube channel, Control or Reese, and I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, they, I mean, they're aware of my channel, you know. People do ask me about it and stuff, but for a complete stranger to come up to me, I was like, where is this going? And they said. Oh, I, I volunteer at the Retro Computer Museum in Leicester. And, uh, you know, I, I saw your video on it. And I'm really sorry that I wasn't there that day and I didn't get to meet you. And yeah, it was uh, it, it was a weird experience. Obviously, I've had these experiences when I've been to, you know, shows and stuff. And when I've been to, uh, well, you know, events and things like that, people come up to me and I'm amongst those people. There are other, other people there who have YouTube channels and stuff. And, and I have that same experience kind of the other way around as well. But for someone to come up to me in my day job when I'm fully in work mode and fully immersed in the project that I'm working on and to say, Reese, I'm a fan of your channel. And also I volunteer at that museum that you visited last week. And also, um, you know, you need to come back and, and see our new building and all the expansion and stuff. And he was really enthusiastic, this guy. His name's Carl. So uh, hello. Uh, shout out to Carl if, if you're also a rambler. I'm not quite sure. We didn't quite get onto that. I was in a rush to go and train someone, I think. But um, yeah, just a really odd thing. So yeah, that was the video that I made a year ago on my local retro computer museum. And really great to meet uh, Andy, who uh, who managed the museum really passionate guy and it's great to see it going from strength to strength and you know hearing that they've moved into this bigger building i had heard about that but um you know it was telling me a little bit more about the uh, kind of the background behind that the workshops and stuff that they've been running which is great cool to see them succeeding and indeed kickstart the amiga show which is happening at the end of this month and which i will talk about in a bit more detail in uh, some future rambles um I, I actually have a table there where I'll be showing some stuff and it, it is right next to the Retro Computer Museum table. So Carl, uh, Carl told me that he's not going to be attending that show, but um, hopefully I'll get to beat up with some of the volunteers from the museum again and talk about old times. So that would be nice. So I just thought I'd mention that, just a little uh, weird happening from this week, but that really is all that I've got for you. 
and I'm going to go home and have a snooze because apparently I'm really struggling. <laughs> But it's okay. It's just tiredness. There's uh, there's nothing more to it. But thank you ever so much for uh, for joining me. Uh, watch out for that video, of course, about the Atari ST and the scalers, and of course the the video on the main channel about the OSSC Pro. Well worth watching. Great videos. I should know. I made them. And uh, yeah, that's it. So bye. <laughs>